Does this work? It works. Uh -huh. So uh, thanks to the organizers for uh, the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, this is Bangalore is also the you know it's, this is where I grew up as a kid, and although it's more than 30 years since I left to study here and there, and it feels good to be back. Uh, although I don't recognize the city that I grew up in, it just changes too fast. But this part of Bangalore reminds me of the Bangalore I grew up in. It was kind of very rustic and bucolic. Nanil Vanchur, Kannadal Matadana and Kunde. Yara Kannadal Matadira Ile. Maybe no. So then I should just stick to English. I thought in my in the local language, uh, but I don't think I know how to say what's the cuspidal automorphic representation in Kannada. <laughs> okay, so. I would like to uh, report on some recent work which involves the special values of L functions. And this panel is almost dry. You know, so the many people from Germany, what we need to borrow from Germany is, you know, der Wischer. We need this, uh, uh, this, this squeegee here. Okay, uh, so to set the stage, let me just uh, talk about some introductory, make some introductory remarks. I suppose uh, the earliest example of a special value of an L function is maybe this. And I've got to talk about this, especially because we have this room named after uh, Madhava. And this is a 14th century theorem that this series, this alternating series, uh, sums to pi by 4. Madhava and uh, later Leibniz. These days, one just calls this Madhava Leibniz series. And this, of course, you know this, uh, this is the value at 1 of uh, the L function attached by Dirichlet to the quadratic Dirichlet character mod 4. And this is pi by 4. And in this talk, I'll be looking at results where it will be very difficult to pin down that rational number or maybe an algebraic number. So up to some rational quantity, this is pi. This, this is the way I'm going to state many results. and. This is, uh, I might call such results, rationality results. Uh, more generally, one can look at the value of this L function at, you know, I can look at uh, 1 minus 1 over 1, 3 cubed, plus 1 over 5 cubed, and so on. And so what are all such uh, points at which, what are all value, interesting values of S that I can stick in? So there's something called a critical set for this L function. For this particular guy, it's going to be uh, all the odd positive integers. And the critical set is always, the definition is symmetric with respect to the functional equation. The definition is the gamma factors on either side of the functional equation shouldn't be poles. And so uh, if you work this out, that's a minus 2. Maybe here, if I have a 1 plus 2m, there's a minus 2m. It's an infinite set of odd positive integers and even negative integers. Or, uh, you know, I can jump a couple of centuries, and this is from 1730s. You know that this was an open problem in the history of calculus for almost a century, and this 26-year-old kid summed the series and said that it's pi squared by 6, which now we see this as a special value of the Riemann zeta function. And more generally, one can do zeta of 2m, and Euler, in fact, summed that also. This is pi to the 2m up to an explicit non-zero rational number. So this is the shape of a, a rationality result for the Riemann zeta function. Or I can flip-flop uh, using the functional equation. And there, in fact, it's easy to remember the, the rational number is minus b2m by 2m, where b2m is the 2 mth Bernoulli number. And here, the critical set. So you know the the gamma factor on either side is pi to the minus s by 2 gamma s by 2 times zeta s, and that's invariant under s goes to 1 minus s. And if you look at, you've got to eliminate the poles, uh, possible poles at integral points for that gamma s by 2, and then you see that the critical set is this list. All the even positive integers are the odd negative integers. Yeah. So, so this was just a precursor, uh, but really for this talk, let me recall for you a theorem of Shimura from the 70s. 
77, I think, in a paper in Mathematische Handeln, which states that if I take a holomorphic cusp form of weight k, some level, some, some nebentipus, and I, I ask it to be primitive, eigenform, new form, normalized, and I take another cusp form, say g, of weight l, same level, some other nebentipus, say chi, also primitive, and I want to look at the degree four rankin selberg l function attached to this pair of uh, modular forms. And I want to stare at the critical values of this l function. There are critical points if the weights are unequal, and let me, without loss of generality, say l is less than k. Then the critical set for the rankin selberg l function is, is a finite set running from this to that, really. So it's L, L plus 1, goes up till K minus 1. And if I take an integer M here, what Shumara proved is that if I look at the value at M of this rankin selberg L function, this looks like up to a quantity in a number field predicated by the object I start with. So I take, because these guys are primitive, if I take the field obtained by adjoining the Fourier coefficients of, say, F, this is a finite extension. And Likewise, I also adjoin the Fourier coefficients of g up to this, up to an element of this number field. It's 2 pi i, this can be 0, 2 pi i to the uh, maybe 2m. I should look up what the explicit expression It's something like 2m plus 1 minus l or something like this uh, times the Peterson norm of the modular form of larger weight times the Gauss sum of the Nebenchipus character of the modular form of smaller weight. So there is a theorem of this shape. And this, by the way, is for the finite part of the L function. And from this, the observation I want to make is, if I suppose there is enough space here, uh, and I have, let, if I also suppose that M plus 1 uh, is also critical. So what I mean is, if L is less than or equal to M, less than M plus 1, less than or equal to K minus 1, then, if I now work with the completed L function, these, the periods here that you see are the same. It doesn't, this, this part is independent of M. The, the dependence on M is only the 2 pi i. And this is exactly the contribution coming from the gamma factors at infinity. That's a trivial calculation. And one can check or one can rewrite this as the L value at a critical point and the value at the next point for the completed L function are the ratio is algebraic and in the relevant number field, in the rationality field of the forms here. This again? Yeah, so no. <laughs> yeah, this is, it, in some sense, the, uh, the charm of this way of writing is to avoid writing any period. Uh, if I know one L value in terms of some period, the, the period information is this guy really here. It's, it's a product of the two periods that you can attach to the modular form, this guy. An individual L value itself is, uh, in this, the way I'm sort of weaving this storyline is not a period. I'm not writing it as a period. That gets absorbed in, coming from, by the contribution at infinity. That, that, or ask this question. So, in this talk, uh, what I'd like to tell you is sort of the, the take home message is a theorem I can prove for, let me just call this star. I'm going to make this precise. This is just for the introductory part of this talk. Uh, and anal an, an analogous rationality result holds for rankin selberg L functions for GLN cross GL and prime over a CM field. statement of this kind. I'm going to make this precise uh, through the talk. 
And the proof is, uh, so this uses the machinery of Eisenstein cohomology. So this is what was pioneered by Harder and what Harder and I, so what I should say is uh, uh, generalizing. Generalizing my work with uh, Günter Harder. So we studied Eisenstein cohomology for GLN over a totally real field. And in this work, basically I have to go through all, most of the steps when I change from a totally real to a CM field. So this, I'm happy to tell you, is uh, going to appear as a volume in the Annals of Math Studies sometime soon. Okay, so now I want to pick up my notation and sort of uh, uh, set things up to make this statement precise. So towards this, well, I need to start with the relevant objects. So this is now maybe the second the main theorem, although it might take me a good 15 minutes before I can get to the main theorem. So I want to put down, uh, I want to give meaning to some notation which I'm going to denote a sigma f is going to be a Hecke summand contributing to the cohomology of a group Gn, which I'm going to define in a second, with coefficients in some, with some weight mu. And I'm going to ask this to be strongly inner. So I, I want, I'm going to define this. So my base field is, uh, is a CM field. So what I mean is it's a quadratic, totally imaginary quadratic extension over a totally real field. So this is totally real, and this is totally imaginary. And I'll have a certain coefficient field, some field E, which is large enough, and so whatever large enough, yeah, maybe in this talk I don't want to say, it's just, it's a, it's a Galois extension of Q, and takes a copy of F. So my coefficient field will be there. This is going to play the role of uh, this. And also at some stage, I will want to adjoin uh, a square root of minus one. So I'm going to ask E to contain that too. So my objects later is going to be cuspidal automorphic representations of GLN or GLN prime over this field. And the rationality fields will be contained in that field. And the point is I want to develop the story at a rational level, at an arithmetic level. Okay, so what's GN? So GN is going to be my restriction of scalars of the group GLN over F. And I fix some standard data. The restriction of scalars are the standard Borel of, say, upper triangulars, uh, the torus inside this the center. So each one of them is a restriction of scalars of what you naturally think of as n by n matrices. And inside this lives a copy uh, of GM. like the center of the center, a copy of GM which sits diagonally in the various embeddings. Okay, uh, I'm going to take mu is a weight for the torus, but a base change to E, the splitting field, takes a copy of F. And I'm going to ask this weight mu to be dominant, integral, So what is mu? Mu is really uh, a collection of, uh, let's say, mu taus, where tau runs through embeddings of f to e. And each mu tau is, if I take this as upper triangular, is, is a string of integers, say, ordered thus. And I'm going to ask, we're going to suppose that this weight mu is pure. So purity is the statement that there exists an integer w such that mu tau of j plus mu tau bar, uh, so what's bar? So maybe here, let me just, I can take any embedding from E to C, and then I can use complex conjugation, and this one has to check that this definition is independent of that embedding from E to C. Uh, so mu, mu tau at j and mu tau bar at n minus j plus 1 is, uh, is a constant independent of uh, all embeddings and all j. It's like these representations that you should think of 
GLNC as a real group, and I'm taking a finite dimensional representation, so there are these two copies, and there are two weights, and purity is one as the dual of the other, pretty much. Only pure weights, the reason for this condition is only pure weights can support cuspidal cohomology, which I haven't yet defined, but it'll come. Okay, and I'm going to let M mu or E is algebraic, uh, irreducible, maybe absolutely irreducible uh, representation of the group GN base change to E with highest weight mu. So this is my, the analog of this K, if you will. And now, let me uh, uh, take a KF, is an open compact subgroup of GAF, G, G maybe is GN, and I take K infinity inside GR, it's a maximal compact, so I take K infinity to be, it's basically the maximal compact since I'm working over a CM field is is a product of GL and C, so I take a product of UNs, except I slightly thicken this up with the real points of this, sort of the center of the center, so to speak. This is simply to make this locally symmetric space, finite volume, GA mod GQ mod K infinity KF. This, by the way, is connected. The minus one gets absorbed into unitary. And I'm going to let m mu e tilde to be the sheaf of e vector spaces over this locally symmetric space. Well, technically, this need not be a local symmetric space. There could be a little bit of pinching. I can pass to a subgroup of finite, pass to a subgroup of finite index here, and then, uh, then this is a locally symmetric space, in which case this guy will be a local system, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And the basic object of interest is the cohomology of the space with coefficients in the sheaf. And there are different techniques to study these cohomology groups, and also depends on what you want to do with them. So I, somehow one tries to set up the context so that uh, it's amenable to is this story. In particular, I can look at cohomology with compact supports, and, or rather the image of cohomology with compact supports inside global cohomology, and that's what's called inner or interior cohomology. So this is inner cohomology. The image of compactly supported in global. And inside this lives another uh, space, so with, this is part of this work with harder, uh, which we call strongly inner so what's strongly inner instead of defining what's strongly inner I'll give you the characterizing property of strongly inner and so fact theorem uh, that if I take this strongly inner cohomology and I take any embedding of e to c rendering my context transcendental, where now I can appeal to the theory of automorphic forms, then this, if I base change to C, this is cuspidal cohomology, as was first defined by maybe Eichler and Shimura, which if you will, if you want to see the space of cusp forms, it's a relatively algebra cohomology with coefficients in the space of cusp forms. Something like that. No, so the, it's so th this is there is something deep here. So uh, if no. 
Uh, so I'm going to say something about this. So what's sitting here is classically that if I take the space of weight k, level n forms, for, let's say for gamma naught n, then there is a basis of cusp forms with rational Fourier coefficients. So the space of cusp forms admits a Q structure. So this really, various versions of this goes back to Shimura, and then the story for GL2 would be Harder and Walsh-Berger for GLN, uh, Clozel, which, which is a statement that cuspidal cohomology admits a rational structure. Uh, and saying it this way is... Uh, the idea is, you know, you can, you can talk about some, and of course, I got to say, there is an action of a Hecke algebra on all of this. So these are not just vector spaces, there's a Hecke action, and then I'm looking at, I can look at some ants. This inner cohomology is semi simple. I can look at some ants, irreducible some ants uh, for the Hecke action appearing in inner cohomology. I can ask, well, what contribution, what relation do they have to? to the space of cusp forms, and then you can transcendentalize the situation, and then one can assert something like this. Not for everything inner, but it's basically, this part, you should think of it as some sort of an arithmetic avatar of the space of cuspidal cohomology, okay? So, yes, so this, it, it, it's, this is more, it's just, uh, that's correct. It's or the the punch is really organizing one's thoughts differently. You can identify cuspidal cohomology rationally. No. This is GLN. This is GLN. Yeah. Okay, and. So, the sigma f, maybe I should write this here. So, sigma f, this notation, this notation means sigma f is an irreducible Hecke command contributing to strongly inner cohomology. And so what does this mean? This means now that uh, if I take any embedding of E to C and I transcendentalize the situation, this is the finite part of a cuspidal automorphic representation contributing cuspidal automorphic representation uh, of cohomological type. So whose representation at infinity, so this cohomological type is the representation at infinity has non-zero relatively algebra cohomology iota sigma infinity twisted by this finite dimension. This is non-zero. Okay, so this is the object one starts with. And now I want to uh, to have all my notations to state the theorem. Yeah, almost. And now I take uh, two such. I want to talk about rankin selberg hill functions. So I take a sigma and I take a sigma prime for GLN prime. And I want to... Uh, I need, I need to introduce two, two quantities depending on the weights mu and mu prime. One is the, what we call the abelian width, A mu mu prime. This involves the, this purity weight, and since there are two weights now, I'm going to denote this purity weight W mu. So the abelian width between mu and mu prime is W mu minus W mu prime over 2. 
and I want to introduce the cuspidal width, which I'm going to denote L mu mu prime. This, before I put it down, is if you remember Shimura's theorem, which unfortunately I've just erased, uh, there was a weight K cusp form and a weight L cusp form, and my critical set went from, from the smaller weight L, L plus 1, up till K minus 1. And the total number of points here, if you do the calculation, is K minus L. So this, this is the cuspidal width. It's how far these guys are apart from each other. Or how far are the cuspidal parameters, if I, if I call K and L the cuspidal parameters, how far apart are they from each other? So here, uh, instead of putting down a definition, it just takes up too much time. I'll simply say this is the, it's like the minimum uh, of the differences of the exponents of the Langlands parameters of uh, the representations of iota sigma infinity and iota sigma infinity prime for any iota. And fact is these guys are independent of uh, this A mu mu prime, L mu mu prime. These are independent. The notation is already suggesting that are independent of iota. Okay, so now I have all my notations to state the theorem. Maybe I keep this diagram of fields. I was hoping to get done writing this up before this conference and put it out, but I guess I'm still somehow dotting the I's and crossing the T's, so to speak. Uh, but I'm almost there, maybe by the end of this month they should be out. So I take as a cuspidal automorphic representation of GLN, except I think of this at an, at an arithmetic level. So there is this base field, there's a base field F and a quotient field E. And I take a sigma F prime, likewise for GLN prime. In this case, and iota always will be uh, embedding, making this context transcendental. In this case, the critical set of the rankin selberg l function, iota sigma, iota sigma prime, and I'm going to take the dual or the contragradient of the second guy. That's just technical. Uh, you can ignore it. This critical set consists of the set of all integers, integers or possibly half integers, and that's just some motivic normalization, it involves this, uh, half the sum of positive roots of these groups. So it turns out that it's integer or half integer depending on the parity of capital N, which is going to be N plus N prime. And these integers are between one minus L mu mu prime over two plus A mu mu prime and less than or equal to m, less than or equal to l mu mu prime, the cuspidal width over 2, plus the abelian width. Stare at these numbers, then the, the number of critical points, you, I got the same a on both sides, they'll cancel. So this guy minus that plus 1, so the, the number of critical points is in fact as many as the Hospital width. And this is, this is tying up with this comment here. Yeah. So that, that's just a parenthetical remark. So these are all the critical points where, which I, where I can uh, hope to prove an Euler or a Madhava-like statement. And the theorem is, uh, so if m and m plus 1 are both critical, And also observe that uh, the critical, maybe I should make two, two comments here. The next comment is the critical set 
is independent of IOTA. The, the cuspidal and the abelian widths are, widths are independent of IOTA, the embedding. So this is the kind of statement that if I, for example, take a Hilbert modular form, whose weights are k1, k2 through k, whatever, d, if d is the degree of the totally real field, then the critical set depends on the minimum of the k's and the maximum of the k's. In particular, if I have a Galois action on the Hilbert modular form, the Galois action permutes these weights. The minimum and maximum are still the same. The gamma factors at infinity are the products of gamma s plus ki minus 2 kind of factors, and the product is, doesn't see permuting these. So it's independent of uh, you know, the, this, the Galois action or the way I have set it up, the iota here. Okay, so I take two of these, and then the statement is, if I look at the completed L function, completed Rankine-Selberg L function attached to this pair, divided by the value at the next critical point, this quantity is in iota E, and this is a finite Galois extension. Iota is an embedding from here to C, so really, it, uh, it actually maps into iota E, which lives there. So that's an algebraic number, and furthermore, so to state this in a sort of reciprocity law-like fashion, furthermore, if I have any uh, Galois el uh, element of the Galois group of uh, Q, and I hit this ratio by this hit this ratio by a Galois element, then I get the corresponding ratio with the tau circle iota, that embedding of E to C uh, from that embedding from E to C. So as far as rationality results are concerned, this in some sense is the sort of theorem that one expects to prove. Uh, there are several comments to make here. So, so comment one is, all such statements about critical values of L functions, there is this conjecture of Delin about special values of motivic L functions. And if you believe in this dictionary in the Langlands program between motives and maybe algebraic automorphic forms or cusp forms of cohomological type, uh, and you can ask, is this compatible with Delin? And the assertion is, it is compatible. Of course, I don't, I, otherwise I wouldn't have been <laughs> compatible with Delin. So in fact, this follows from something which Delin and I are writing up, which involves uh, periods Functorial transfers of motives, functorial periods, functoriality, and motives. Those are the buzzwords. Second comment. Of course, this theorem on GLN cross GLN prime, you know, there were various special cases which were known. Uh, so I got to start with, uh, say this again. So you take a motive of rank n over f with coefficients in E. You take a motive of rank n prime over f with coefficients in E. I look at the tensor product of these two. So that's the functorial transfer in this case. It's an easy case. There are, there are several other, you know, after this work with Harder, I'm, today I'm just announcing this theorem about GLN cross GLN prime over a CM field. I mean, some many of you here have heard me give talks about there is an analogous theorem we have over orthogonal groups and a completely different thing about Asai L functions. So the, in each of those situations, there's a certain functorial, functorial transfer of some motive. Uh, for example, I can take a quadratic extension of, say, totally real, say, a real quadratic extension, F over Q. I can take a smooth projective variety over X. I can look at its cohomology, that's maybe one motive. Or I can take the restriction of scalars from F to Q, and I can take that motive. Uh, there is some relation between these two. 
And at the Galois, at the elliptic realization level, this is really the twisted tensor induction, giving me uh, the SIL function. So in every situation I've worked in, there's some, you start somewhere, and then there's one is looking at a certain L function, and maybe there's a functorial transform. Second comment, yeah, I was telling you the past work here, uh, of course, Blasius, uh, his famous thesis in Annals, where he proved Delian's conjecture for really there's only one group and it's GL1, so Hecker functions over CM fields, uh, which ties up with Harder's work uh, for Eisenstein cohomology or GL2. There is Michael Harris, who worked with in certain situations over unitary groups and you know, the corresponding L function you can think of as instances of this sort of after base change, rankin selberg L functions over a CM field. There were their collaborators around Harris. Uh, especially, I have to mention uh, Zhi Lin, is uh, one of his former students. Uh, Harold Grobner, also Gunja Sachdeva, uh, who has worked on. So, for example, in Gunja's thesis, written in Nicer Pune, uh, she has a theorem of this kind for GL3 cross GL1 using some other kind of machinery, not Eisenstein cohomology, but something else. So, there, there were various. Uh, special cases of such a theorem known before. So, how am I doing on time? Uh -huh. So, I forgot one important condition to mention. There is a, the weights mu and mu prime. You see, I, I need enough space. This string of integers can be only one. You know, I can, I can take k to be l plus one. But I need to have at least two critical points. So, I need to assume a certain combinatorial condition on mu and mu prime, which I'd like to explain. This was probably the most challenging of the technical ingredients which went into the theorem. Yeah, exactly. So this is one of those conditions. Uh, so what you will see. Uh, combinatorial lemma with all these notations as above, uh, the following are equivalent. First, the points, the specific points minus n by 2 and 1 minus n by 2 are critical for this rankin selberg function. Two, the abelian width is bounded by the cuspidal width. And by this, I mean some inequalities of this kind. Yeah. I will tell you the sort of philosophical content in this in a second. Uh, and third, that there exists an element in the wild group, not any element, but it needs to be a constant representative for a parabolic P. Let me introduce my, uh, so G is of course GLN, the restriction of scalars, uh, and P, is the restriction of scalars of the standard parabolic of type n n prime in GLN. And one looks at these special representatives uh, delineated by constant, uh, which are representatives for the, the wild group of the levy inside the wild group of G. There exists a constant representative such that Two things happen. If I take the weight mu plus mu prime, what I mean is I, one is on GLN, another is GLN prime, I just concatenate these two weights and think of it as a weight on my ambient GL capital N. Uh, that need not be dominant. I need an element in the wild group to make it dominant. And I'm using a certain twisted, the twisted action of wild group uh, elements on weights. Uh, this should be dominant. And the, this is always possible. The, the subtle point is, and I want the length of this guy to be, so 
sort of balanced. I want it to be half the dimension of the unipotent radical of P. Little, the final statement is these elements of the wild group themselves are, you know, I just go to the, go to the splitting field, uh, and then uh, each of them should be, uh, this, this length should add up to n n prime. This would be the, for all. So what is, what sort of statements are these? So first is, first statement is basically saying that there are two critical points, at least two, two so I can have two consecutive critical points and then there is some hope of asking such a thing. The second is basically telling me I can, if I prove a statement about say zeta 2 and I take my object at hand in which case there is a Tate motor and I, I twist it, I do Tate twists, if I prove some statement for one L value, question is can I get all other L values? So I start doing Tate twists. The abelian width, if you stare at the purity weight, this changes by whatever is the integer by which I'm doing my Tate twist. And the cuspidal width, this doesn't change. So this is part of the uh, definition, you know, one has to just stare at it for a little while and then realize these guys are unchanged. So that means, given one statement for one particular L value or one particular ratio of L values and I allow myself all the Tate twists, do I get other ratios of L values? And what is embedded here is from the content of one and two is we get a statement for every successive ratio of critical values no more and no less. Okay. And what is this statement? This is where now we start getting into the realms of the proof of uh, the story of this theorem. This is really a statement about uh, uh, the appearance, 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 whatever, uh, of uh, the induction from P to G of sigma cross sigma prime, really the finite parts, in the boundary cohomology. in some optimal degree. So this, when I say boundary, I'm talking about the borel sayer compactification, and then the borel sayer boundary, whose cohomology one attempts to understand, and the, uh, the appearance of a certain induced representation is dictated by some elements of the wild group like this. So this is, now we get to the technical heart of the story. So, so now I have to introduce uh, Eisenstein cohomology and how one proves these such theorems. I have to tell you, this, this way to get to statements of this kind is an idea, you know, this is Harder's idea, which he probably had even before I was born, and we have been pursuing this program for a totally real field for almost 10 years. Uh, that part is now done, and so this, this way of thinking is really, you know, it's, it's harder. I mean, it's, of course, one always has to make that joke about Harder's name, yeah, okay. <laughs> Gets harder with time, maybe. <laughs> so, uh, so now I want to talk about Eisenstein, cohomology, and simultaneously, since I'm running out of time here, uh, give you a feel for how one proves such statements. Okay. So, I'll say some things, and I'll try to write minimally, otherwise, you know, just to finish in time. So, I told you the basic object of interest is this, the cohomology of this locally symmetric space with coefficients in the sheaf coming from an algebraic irreducible finite dimensional representation. Okay, we start there. Now, this space is not compact. There is a, a Borel-Serre compactification. There are several compactifications. What we use is Borel-Serre. And the compactification is the manifold together with some boundary. And this boundary is stratified in terms of GQ conjugacy classes of uh, parabolics and G. And there's one piece for every boundary component.
One can look at the cohomology of each of these boundary strata and there's a spectral sequence which sort of brings that together, which converges to the cohomology of the boundary. So all that is there in this background. Now, one can look at the, the long exact sequence and cohomology for the topological pair, this compactification, comma, the boundary with this coefficient system. And from that long exact sequence, I can look at the restriction map, the cohomology of the boundary. And now comes the first technical theorem, which is to say that in this boundary cohomology, there is this is a theorem, so it's harder and myself for the totally real and analogously for a same field uh, is this, I told you there's a spectral sequence built out of the cohomology of these pieces. This piece, the cohomology is built out of induced representations. So if I look at the indu induction from P to G or PF to GF, and I put a sub F, I mean the finite idyllic points of sigma F cross sigma F prime, algebraically induced, so this is not normalized induction, just usual induction, plus the induction from QF to GF, Q is associated parabolic, with sigma F prime with some tate twist, N sigma F minus N prime, something like this. The sum of these two representations, they appear in their relevant boundary pieces, and then this sum splits off from the rest of boundary cohomology. Or in other words, there is a there exists a Hecker equivariant uh, projection. I'll just denote this uh, capital R dot, capital R, calligraphic R, sigma, sigma prime. So this is what Harder calls the man interpret principle. There is a certain splitting off here. This involves classification theorem of Jacquet and Shalaika, which says that if I have two isobaric automorphic representations or two representations of GLN induced from parabolics, uh, which are almost everywhere equivalent, then the inducing is the same parabolic up to, uh, and the same representation up to uh, wild group elements. So that's, that's there, that's, that's an ingredient in proving this. That ingredient plus the sort of hocus pocus of a spectral sequence uh, goes into proving this. Okay, so suppose one has that, then one looks at uh, the image. Oh, by the way, so I, I didn't define Eisenstein cohomology. So here's a quick definition. Eisenstein cohomology is really uh, an artifice which is used to study boundary cohomology. In this case, uh, I'll just say it's the image of global cohomology in the cohomology of the boundary. So I take this and I follow it up with this Hecke equivariant projection, or in other words, I look at the image of Eisenstein cohomology under this projection, and that, understanding that is the, let me see if I can squeeze what I want to say here. What is the what again? I, it, algebraic induction, as against normalized parabolic induction. Uh, this is a big pain in unmentionable parts of anatomy, uh, where you have to use algebraic unnormalized induction when you work with unnormalized, uh, when you work this kind of a geometric setup. But when you want to evoke the machinery of L functions, normalized induction is, and you just have to keep track of these two. So, uh, the second, so maybe this is the first technical theorem. The second technical theorem to prove is what is this image all the way down? So the image of uh, the restriction to boundary cohomology followed up by this Hecke equivariant projection is or consists of classes of the form something here and uh, say xi and some t xi where xi is an element of the induction from p to g of blah, blah, blah. The way you should think of this is, uh, by the way, I have some level structure kf, so one has to take the invariants under the open compact kf in both of these. Let's suppose the open compact is optimal in the sense that this is a one-dimensional space. Okay? I can use the theory of new vectors here if I want, 
but it's really not necessary for this game. But let's pretend this is one dimensional and this is one dimensional. So this is a two dimensional space. So you, to give you a mental picture, you want to think of this image. So this is, this is like a line in a two dimensional space. So I can look at the slope of this line, and so far, remember I'm working at an arithmetic level. Everything is happening over E, as these are modules over E, and you know, I have to set up everything arithmetically. So I can look at the slope of this line, so the slope of this line is something in E. I mean, it can be zero or it can be infinite. I will tell you the interpretation of, I mean, if, it's, if the image is vertical, what it means. But let's take a sort of generic case when there is some finite slope. On the other hand, and now I'm getting into the proof of this theorem, if I render my situation transcendental, so take any uh, iota going from E to C, then one has to prove that the slope of this line is a certain ratio of L values. The value at minus n by 2 iota sigma, iota sigma prime dual. If I induce from sigma cross sigma prime, here you'll be looking at the rankine cell for sigma cross sigma prime dual. Okay, so that's the, and one minus n by two, iota sigma cross. Actually partial L values. And then you have to keep track, do some extra work and get this. So on the one hand, the slope was an E. On the other hand, if I base change to complex numbers, one has to prove that you get this as a slope. So then the conclusion from these two is, well, this lives, has to live in iota. So this is, this is how one proves this theorem. And what is involved in this? Well, here, what we're really doing is we are appealing, we are using Langlands's uh, constant term theorem. I got an induced representation, I take a section, I take an Eisenstein series, compute the constant term with respect to the associate parabolic, then I get, it's the same as, as if I'm applying the standard intertwining operator. So this guy transcendentalized is the standard intertwining operator, which locally almost everywhere is a certain ratio of L functions. And it's this ratio of L functions. Uh, so in some sense, the proof the, is, the idea is, so, so we give, we give a cohomological interpretation to Langlands's constant term theorem. So that's the one line idea behind how this works. So I got two minutes, it's not. Uh, so what other technical ingredients are there? Well, I told you this, this kind of this gindipkin carplay which calculation is an almost everywhere calculation. Uh, so there are problems to solve at Archimedean places and at finite ramified places. The Archimedean sub-problem is a hard one. Uh, one needs to prove, I'll just say this without writing. Uh, I have the standard intertwining operator between an induced representation and its sort of its partner. One has to look, first one has to prove that these induced representations at infinity are irreducible the standard intertwining operator, because of these guys being critical. Uh, there's an isomorphism. It induces an isomorphism in GK cohomology, and, it, and these GK cohomology groups are one-dimensional. So then if I fix basis optimally, this isomorphism between two one-dimensional spaces is a number. What is that number? That number has to be this L values of the gamma factors at infinity. This is a sort of hard technical Archimedean problem. And it is at this stage that I need to invoke, uh, I want my I uh, to live in this coefficient field. And uh, non-Archimedean uh, ingredient, other than the gindikin kaplevich at ramified places is, is an easy observation that these kind of the local L values, uh, these guys are already in the relevant coefficient systems. So this is already in iota E. This is an easy, uh, easy observation. So such are, such are some of the ingredients, and I think, I think I'll just stop here. Thanks.
Yes. So, the, yeah, so in fact, th this is true for all n and n prime. Uh, for example, what harder I, I did over a totally real field, the parities of n and n prime matters. There, n and n prime have to have, uh, one of them should be E1, is what we had to assume. If both are odd, for example, I could have taken both to be one, and I'm looking at the Riemann zeta function, two successive integers are never critical. Uh, but in over a CM field, it works for any n and n prime. Uh, so, uh, you get the ratio at this minus n by 2, yeah. how do you go to the others? Uh, so, that's the Tate twist. Uh, so, the value at s plus some, some integer m of, in this case, let's say sigma cross sigma prime, is also the value at s of sigma twisted by absolute to the m sigma prime for example, or I can absorb it into the next guy. And this guy will have uh, uh, sigma, I'll just do sigma bracket m, has cohomology with respect to mu minus m. This doesn't change the cuspidal parameters, but it changes the abelian, uh, that purity weight. And this, so you see, the, these two extremes are unchanged. So then you can ask, what are the possible m's I can allow for these twistings? And turns out, I can capture all critical Ratios of critical values, no more and no less. So this is somehow the beauty of this lemma. Uh, and you, you're using the constant term of the Eisenstein series, so you're getting ratios, and it's not individual guys. Yes, yeah. Yeah. exactly. No further questions, let's thank the speaker once again.